Easter Sunday, the culmination of the whole Christian year, the most important event that ever took place in human history. This morning I've, I've titled our message, Because He Lives, and if you're following at all, you'll notice that there are some similarities between what I want to share and in the song that we sang this morning. We're here on Easter Sunday for one really big, oh, first of all, there's an outline in your bulletin. All the scripture is in there, so don't worry about frantically trying to write down scripture references. They're all there. If you want to just kick back and listen and not worry about taking notes today, that's cool. If you want to take notes, that's fine too. Um, if you brought a Bible with you, you, you can open and flip around, but I'll also have all the scripture up on the screen for you today as well. We are here today because Jesus is alive. He is not in the tomb. As we heard the story read earlier, Jesus was not there. We cannot visit his tomb. If you go to Russia, you can visit the tomb of Lenin and the tomb of Stalin. You cannot visit the tomb of Jesus because he is not there. Jesus is alive. This one truth is the very foundation of Christianity. It is the linchpin of our faith. As I've said before, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, I'm going fishing. I'm wasting my time here. The resurrection of Jesus Christ meets our greatest need as human beings. Our need to have our sins taken away. The penalty for our sins taken away. Look what it says in 1 Corinthians 15. Paul says, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless, and you're still in your sins. But the truth is, Christ has been raised. We are no longer condemned by our sins. And the reason God raised Jesus from the dead was to put his divine seal and validation on Christ's sacrifice as sufficient for our sins. First Peter says this, this is for Christ also died for sins once for all. The just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. And God raised Jesus from the dead on the third day to show that his death had been an awesome success. The debt had been paid. The penalty had been accepted. The curse had been lifted. Jesus Christ had done for us the work that we could never do ourselves. He took away our sin and made us right with God. Jesus is alive. He lives, and because he lives, our perspective on everything is changed. We sang this this morning. Because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Deuteronomy 31 says this, The Lord is the one who goes ahead of you. He will be with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. But do not fear or be dismayed. One of the greatest challenges of tomorrow is its uncertainty. There are many times where we don't know what tomorrow will bring for us. It's hard to determine. The weather bank can't even predict the weather, can they? It's hard for us to determine what tomorrow will bring. Or there are other times when we think we know what is waiting for us tomorrow, and it fills us with fear and anxiety. But we need to remember that the Lord has gone before us. The God of the Old Testament told Israel that he had gone before them. We never have to worry about tomorrow because our Lord is already there. Look what he says in Isaiah 45. I will go before you and make the rough places smooth. I will shatter the doors of bronze and cut through the iron bars. Friends, knowing that the Lord has gone before us helps us to be ready for tomorrow's challenges. Remember what Joshua told Israel, and this is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Joshua had taken over in leading Israel, and the next day they were going to head into the Promised Land. And Joshua told Israel this, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. It's one of my favorite Scripture verses. The Lord will do wonders among you. We should live every day with that attitude, anticipating the wonders the Lord will do amongst us tomorrow. Because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear 
is gone. In Isaiah 41, this is God speaking, and God says this, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Friends, fear is the opposite of faith. It is so easy to get caught up in our circumstances. There are many times when, from our perspective, our situation may seem hopeless or sometimes even impossible. But remembering what God did for us in the past is one of the greatest things that will help us to trust him in confusing or anxious times. God has proven himself. Look what it says in Philippians 4. Paul says this. He says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Simply put, we need to put everything in God's hands. We need to leave it in his hands and be at peace because they are in his hands, and he can handle things far better than we can. As Peter put it, Peter said this, he said, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. We can cast our anxiety on him. We know he loves us. Look what he did for us. We know he loves us. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because he lives, we know he holds the future. At the Last Supper, Jesus said this to his disciples. He said this, he said, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe in also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, and that where I am, there you may also be. We know that there is a home waiting for us in heaven. We know that. The resurrection of Jesus Christ gives us hope. Not hope of, oh, I hope this goes that way or I hope this goes this way, but an eternal hope, a hope based on truth, a hope based in confidence that God is good, his word is good, and what he says is true. That is where our hope lies. It is a guaranteed hope. Colossians, Paul says this in in the book of Colossians, God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Paul understood that hope very well. You see, friends, because Jesus rose from the dead, we who trust him as our Savior are forgiven. We're pardoned. We're justified. We're made righteous before God. Paul said, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. As believers in Jesus Christ, our future is secure. We know our final destination. And we look forward to that day when we will finally be at home with our Lord for all eternity. Revelation 21 gives us a glimpse of our final home. And this is what it says. It says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will be no longer, there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. Sounds good, doesn't it? I'm ready for that. No death, no crying, no mourning, no pain. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Because he lives, I know he holds the future. And because he lives, life is worth living. Look what Jesus said in John 10, 10. He said, I came that they, and the they is us. I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. I came that Trisha may have life and have it abundantly. I came that Andrew may have life and have it abundantly. I came that Kurt may have life and have it 
abundantly. He came so that we would have an abundant life. The greatest life we could ever live is a life in Jesus Christ. Because through, through Christ, we can live the life which he intended for us. A life which honors him. A life which brings him glory. A life filled with joy and filled with peace and filled with eternal hope. And that joy and that peace and that hope can never be taken away because it's based on God's truth, which never changes. And the cool thing is, it's a life that is lived through his strength and not our own. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. We can live a life with the greatest purpose, friends. Because of Christ's sacrifice, we owe him everything. And because he rose from the dead, we know that he has defeated death. Sin has no power over us, friends. Look what it says in 1 Corinthians. Paul says this, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Know that all that you do is not in vain, that it has value, and it has value in God's eyes. That's why Paul could say this in Galatians, I've been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me, and gave himself up for me. Life is worth the living, friends. As we seek Christ, the one who created us, the one who created us for a purpose, the one who died for us so that we might spend eternity with him, as we seek him, we can have and experience that abundant life that he so willingly gives us. And it's not a temporary life. It is an eternal life. I want to leave you with this blessing this morning. I'm going to ask the worship team to come and ask you to stand, please. This is what the writer of Hebrews says. Stand with me, please. He says, Now the God of peace, who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, may he equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen?